Okay, hello. 15 minutes is come and gone. Let's try to get back to our lesson. Looks like we lost some people. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you uh, what we call a pearl of wisdom. Have you heard of that pearl of wisdom? You know, Inje or Inji, you know, a pearl of wisdom. I'm 54 years old. I've been teaching 30 years. And one of the things that I've discovered is students that come to class do better than students who don't come to class. And so I'm looking around at a section of 50. I see about half the chairs empty. And so you are the 25 who came. And you're going to probably do better on the midterm exam, on the homeworks, and on the quizzes than students who don't come. Not probably. You, you will. I mean, statistically, it just shows. If you don't come to class and you say, I'll get the notes later, I'll watch the videos later, it doesn't work. Nobody invests that much time after they didn't invest the time to come to class. This is simple. Just come on Tuesday and Friday afternoons and you get class. I stand here, I try to teach, you get a chance to ask questions. Uh, if you're confused, you come up during the break or after or before. If you don't come to class, all those opportunities are gone and you're trying to up our topar, make it up some other way. So I strongly encourage you, not you to come to class, you're coming to class. I encourage you to tell your friends who aren't coming to class, they should come to class. Um, are we taking attendance? No. Are you going to fail because you didn't come to class? No. You're going to fail because you didn't know the things that you didn't learn because you didn't come to class. Okay, that's you know, a chain there. I don't fail directly because you're not here, but there's an indirect consequence to not coming. So I'm, I'm really sad to see this just you know, the week before our midterm exam that people think they're going to kind of catch it all up real quick. Uh, it's just not a good strategy. And, and that's what separates out the A students we're going to go get foreign scholarships and go to master's and PhDs outside Turkey. From the B students who are going to get inside Turkey and get admitted to a master's program. From the C students who are going to get a job and work in the Piazza. From the D and F students who aren't even going to be able to graduate from Bilkan. I mean, th this is serious business. We're talking about your life. And there's a consequence to attending class. Not just this class. I'm talking about every class at Bilkan University. You know, talk your pet. Come to class. It's a simple thing. Get out of bed, get out of the Mozart, get out of the cafe, get out of the lunchroom, get out of the car and just be here. I, I shouldn't have to say it. And I'm talking to the wrong people. I really want to talk to the 25 who are not here. I want you to come to class. I want you to be in class. <laughs> Where are you today? What are you doing that's so important that you're not in CS224? How are you going to learn pipelining if you don't come and give me a chance? Yeah, okay. I, you can tell them too, okay. <laughs> All right. So now uh, we're going to move on and start talking about forwarding. Okay, now if you look here, what we have is kind of a uh, multi-conditional uh, statement um, written in Verilog. It doesn't really look like much Verilog. It could be anything, but let's see how, what we're going to do here. The uh, X, or execute stage forwarding unit, which would be the one that will um, forward from the output of the execute back into the input of the execute. In other words, from the outputs of our ALU to the inputs of our ALU. Um, it forwards the result from the previous instruction to either input of the ALU. Now, the reason we say either input, it should be reasonably clear from this. If I need to get the value of this addition real quick, I'm going to put it on the upper input of the ALU if, it, if it's written here. But if it was register 5, I want to put it on the lower input. In other words, this is the RS and this is the RT, or bus A and bus B. I have to be able to forward to here, but I also have to be able to forward to here. So that's what it means by to either input. Oops, it's not there. Okay. So I have to be able to take the output from the pipeline register and send it around to an input. Let's see what it says. It says, if this condition and this condition and this condition are met, forward A. But if this condition and this condition and this condition are met, forward B. Now, this 10 is the control signal for the MUX, which means let the forwarded value go in, not the register value. So this says let it in the MUX on A. This says let it in the MUX on B. These are a control signal name. It's a two-bit control signal. That means it has at most four possibilities. This is a two-bit control signal. What are the conditions? Well, if you notice, they're very similar, okay? Very, very similar. The only difference is this says for RS, this says for RT. So once we understand this, we'll understand this pretty well. If the signal um, <coughs> for reg right in the 
execute memory stage is true. So this, this is a pipeline, and this is a field of a pipeline. So in the pipeline register, which is the execute memory pipeline, if the signal for reg write is true, well, when is the signal for reg write true? Yeah, in the end of this instruction, I'm going to write something into the register file. That's when reg write is true. When is reg write false? If I'm not going to write anything into the register file, like store word, branch, jump, then I don't write anything. But if I'm going to write something into the register file, and if the register destination that I'm going to write it into isn't zero, got it? I mean, that'd be pretty silly to try to write into register zero. It's a hard wire. But anyway, if it means any other register but zero, then, oh wait, and if the destination register I want to write into happens to be the RS register that I'm trying to read out from. This is, I will write, it, I, it will be not register 0, and I, this value will be RD field. If that RD field happens to be the same as the IDEX, which is right now, not future, RS field, what does that mean? It means I have a data dependency. I'm going to write into this one, and it's the same as the one I'm trying to read from now. And so, you know what's going to happen? It means this data is going to change this. If I take this, it's going to be wrong. So I don't want to get the RS field. I want to get the output from the ALU right now and put it in, OK? And that's what I'll do here. So if you're going to write, and if it's not to register 0, and if the uh, register that you're going to write to, the RD, if it is the one you're trying to read from right now, don't read from it now. Instead, forward. That's the meaning of that. OK? Did you read the syntax, and can you follow that? This says the same thing. It says if the one you want to write into is the RT field right now that you're trying to read from, don't read from it. Instead, take the forwarded value. OK? That's for the execution units forwarding. Now, the memory units forwarding is similar. Let's see what happens here. This says, in the memory write back pipeline stage, a different pipeline register, if I'm going to be doing a register write into the register file when I'm all done, and if the register I'm going to write into isn't 0, it's any of the other 31, and if the register I plan to write into happens to be one that I'm trying to read from right now, then, and that's IDEX, so actually uh, it's very similar, then that forwarding unit value gets 01, OK? No, I'm sorry, it's the same one. Forward A, it's the same one here. So instead of 10, which means forward from the ALU, now we're going to be forwarding from the memory unit, for the memory uh, pipeline stage. Same thing happens here. Only thing that's different is instead of RS, it's RT. So again, I take the value of 00, 01. So that means that if the forward unit is 00, it means don't do this and don't do that. That's just the one where you take the straight data uh, forward. So uh, the forwarding unit's values mean take something different. Let's, we need to see a data path in order to, to uh, uh, make this valuable. OK. Um, can you see here that the ALU has the ability on both of its uh, data inputs to get data from the register file, from the output of the ALU, Yanni, from this pipeline, and from this pipeline. So there's three possibilities for that MUX and three possibilities for that MUX. You can take the data straight in, you can take it back from the ALU can, uh, from this register, or you can take the pipeline register or the other pipeline register. So three possibilities that can uh, be chosen. That's why the codes have to be 00, 01, and 10. Now another kind of a uh, potential data hazard can occur when um, the, there is a conflict between the result of the write back instruction and the memory stage instruction. Which one should be forwarded? Can you see what happens here? I put a new value into register 1 here. I want to use it here and create another new value here. And then I want to use it here. The question is, which one should this one use? Should it use this one or should it use this one? Well, I think it's pretty clear it needs to use this one. Okay. So this one's located in, by the time we get to here, and need to read register one. This one's located in one pipeline register, and this one's located in a different pipeline register, temporarily. In our, the value we created here has now moved on down to here. So at this point, 
the value of register 1 is found twice. It's found in this pipeline stage, and it's also found in this pipeline stage. And the question is, which one should I take here? Which one should I take? The, yeah, the most recent one, this one, and not take this one. So I'm going to have to now make a choice, and my code is going to have to force me to say, if I match, and if I match, choose uh, the more important match. Okay. Um, the second thing is, let's see if there's anything else here. Um, I think that's it. That's all. Okay, so the code got a little more complicated now. Um, the first one forwards the results from the previous instruction to either input of the ALU. Did that change? No, stayed the same. But the memory forwarding unit now got, got more complicated. In other words, we have new, new instruction, new condition here as well. And what's the new condition? It's that we match on this and we don't match on this. You got it? Have a look at what's being asked. Is the register that I intend to uh, put my result in, the destination register, is it equal to this and not equal to this? Hang on. I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. The value of the fields here. There we go. Look. This is in one pipeline uh, register. This is in a different pipeline register. The field here named RD needs to match that. And the field here named RD should not match that. So if that's the condition, then I forward it. Otherwise, um, I'll, I'll not forward. And the same thing happens down here for the RT. So I need to make sure that I'm getting the right one. And this extra line of code uh, allows me to do that. So it forwards, as it says there, forwards the result from the previous or the second previous instruction to either input of the ALU and allows me to have the opportunity to do either, depending on the situation. All right, now here's the hardware, finally. We should have had this a little bit earlier, I think. Okay, can everybody see that the ALU, which used to just have one MUX in front of it to choose between this or the sign extended, has now got a 3 to 1 MUX for the upper input and a 3 to 1 MUX for the lower input. The 3 to 1 MUX for the lower input uh, chooses between this value and the forwarded value on this path and the forwarded value on this path. So let's check out these purple paths and see where they come from. One purple path is coming from here, that's the output of the X mem register, and the other purple path is coming from, mm, did I goof it up? It's supposed to be coming from here. Uh, I think there's a drawing error. Look, this output here is not supposed to go to forwarding, it's supposed to go all the way around to the right data here. I think we've got a little confusion right here. What's supposed to happen is from this forwarding register and this forwarding register, I have the option to take it one clock cycle later or two clock cycles later and bring it to either of those. Okay? That's what, I'm, that's what I want to be able to do, but it, it isn't drawn quite right. Any questions about that? Okay, so look what, what's, what's new here is this MUX and this MUX and this purple feedback path and this should be purple feedback path, but it's, it's not drawn correctly. Um, so both of those two purple feedbacks are from this pipeline register and this pipeline register, giving me options to choose those instead of the normal, which are these. The upper input, the 0, 0 input, is normal input, regular data coming out of here. The 0, 1 input and the, zero and the 1, 0 input are forwarded either from here or from here, depending on which is the correct one that you want. I'm sorry it's, it's not drawn well. This purple is correct. And this purple started good, and then it didn't go to the right place. Okay? It, 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 I'm so sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This forward unit controls. You can see it sends the control signals. But I'm talking about the data paths. The actual data are purple here. One of them is coming from here, and the other one should be coming from here, and it's not. That's the problem. The, the slide is... Got a little issue with. Can you show uh, the second uh, purple line uh, where to go? Yani the yeah. One. yeah. The correct one comes from this right here, ALU, okay, and comes around, and, and it's one of these two. If I trace it, it's this one, the 1 0 input. And the 0 1 input is supposed to be coming from this one. It's supposed to be the, the, the value stored in this register, which I'm allowed to bring back as well. Okay? So it's just one delay later. This is a pipeline register. This is a pipeline register. And we said that we need to be able to forward from the output of ALU 
and from the output of memory to get it back around here. So the, my three choices are the value in register, the value that I calculated here in this pipeline register, the value I got here from that one. That's, my, that's supposed to be my options. Okay? It's just not drawn right. Sorry about that. Okay, now the control of forwarding. Let's look at that part. This forwarding unit here is very important. It makes the decision. You can see that it sends a 2-bit signal to this MUX and a 2-bit signal to this MUX to say which one should I take. So this is the brain for forwarding. This is the way to resolve our data hazards. What does this need as input? And the answer is we saw it on the previous slides. What does it need as input? To, does this work? It says if this and this and this. So what does it need? It needs certain fields from certain uh, pipeline registers. And you can see that it's drawn here. It's bringing in uh, the IDEX register RT, the IDEX register RS. It's bringing in the MEM WB register RD and the EX MEM register RD. It's bringing those in and making choices based on those, okay, as well as, uh, yeah, from there. That, okay. So we've got, looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five, six signals coming into here. The black arrows being, yeah, it's just not drawn very well. But you can understand that what this does is the logic to implement this. Looking at those, what kind of circuitry will be inside the forwarding unit? Looking at those equations, what kind of circuitry? Yeah, just gates, ANDs and OR gates, and strictly combinational logic. You can do it in a two-level Boolean circuit, right? Everybody see that? Okay. All right, so we're not expecting anything fancy. It just has to be done correctly. So if this is done correctly, and these are set up right, and it defaults to 0, 0, if it doesn't pass those, it leaves it at 0, 0, then we're good. Now, it didn't have else 0, 0, but it should. Okay, so for this code here, you know, if this, if this, else 0, 0 for both of those. And again, else 0, 0 for both of those. All right. There we go. We've now got forwarding working in our data path with a very simple circuit that meets these conditions. Any questions? Yeah. The signals is coming uh, in different cycle units. Uh, it, uh, so I think it may cause a problem. A branch uh, signal is come first and later the data Okay. All right. So far, we haven't said anything about branching because we're still trying to solve data dependencies which become data hazards. So, do you want to talk about branching? Uh, but, uh, oh, no. Okay. I get a confused, but uh, uh -huh. in synchronous the signal coming the forward unit not at the same time. Um, I don't know what you mean by not at the same time. I mean. The signals that go to the forwarding unit come from two pipeline registers. The IDEX register, can you tell me which one is that one? That's this one right here. This is the IDEX register, and it brings in two different fields. It brings in that field and brings in that field. So there we go. Those two are inputs to this. Now when you... Not first, not first. At the same time as I have values here, I also have values here and I have values here. You, may, you know how this works, right? Everything's going at once. So all the time there's values here, values here, values here, and values here. All the time. So they're always, once we fill the pipeline, every pipeline register will have a set of data and control values. Yeah, okay. So what we're saying here, at, at any time, all the time, these equations, that's true all the time. Every clock cycle we do that work. And what we're doing is every clock cycle we're examining these two fields from here and these other fields here, EX MEM register RD, MEM WB register RD. So from this one, I'm taking, that's the EX MEM register, I'm taking the destination. And from this one, I'm taking the destination field. And I'm sending them here and I'm controlling to see, do I need to forward? If I don't, I give chif cipher, chif cipher, and let this be my throughput. If I do, I put zero beer or beer zero, and let those or those be my throughput. So I'm doing it continuously all the time. It's not a case of, wrong values at the wrong time. Okay? Do you, you do understand that the instruction which is in this pipeline register is partially computed, it's not finished yet, and the instruction which is in this pipeline register is also partially computed, it's not finished yet, but it's a different instruction and it started one cycle ahead and what we're asking is 
is there something in here which is going to put something in here at risk? And you know what it is, don't you? Am I doing reading here and writing to the same register here, and that can be a problem. And, and you know, just real quick, there we go. Reading here and writing here. In other words, the earlier one was writing. That's the thing I'm looking for. If I have that, I have a hazard, and then I should forward. If I don't have it, I have no hazard. I don't need to forward. So it's about different instructions, but they're in the pipeline registers, different ones, at the same time. And then I can compare them. Okay. I think I think it's pretty complicated. Um, maybe we need to have a little time to discuss it. So let's stop. I don't want to go any further. Uh, this was a good place to to, uh, to to just stop. This is the hardware now. That's the picture of how it's supposed to work. I'm sorry about a few little data path errors, but the main concepts I think we've explained. Um, we could fix that. I hope you could fix it now that we've explained what it has to do. Yeah, Burin. The first purple line. Uh, it seems right according to you. The a register value after it comes uh, out from the LU, the last LU unit. I think it's LU or multiplexer. Last uh, after data memory. Multiplexer. Okay, so I have two values here. As you see, they're both going to be stored in this pipeline. The memory value and the ALU value are both stored here. Mm -hmm. Okay. After it comes out from the multiplexer. Yeah. The last multiplexer. Yeah. The first purple line? Yeah, gets but. The value, what? No, the problem is I had two here and I'm choosing one, and what I'm choosing with is a control signal that I don't have any control over. So I don't want to take it from here. I believe I want to take it directly from here. You, you, in, in, in forwarding, you take values stored in pipeline registers. So therefore, I'm going to want it directly from here, not off of here, but directly from here. And because. There's two different things here. One is the memory's output value, and the other is the ALU value delayed one more clock cycle. You know, I have the ALU value here. One clock cycle later, I'll have it here. But the question is, which one am I going to get here? And the answer is, depends on who's controlling this. So I don't, I don't think that's where I want to get it from. I think it needs to be taken from here, just like this was. Look what happens here. See that purple line? It's right off of the register. It says, if it's in the register, you have it here. Great. There should be something like that here also. And there's not. That's, that's what I objected to. Okay. All right. My friends, if you've got this, you now have not just understood pipelining, you've understood how to fix data hazards with forwarding and pipelining. And that's something you're going to need for project number two. So it's good that you spend some time thinking about this. What you're going to do in project two is you're actually going to write Verilog code to model a processor and then we're going to execute code on that processor in a very log simulator. And if it works, we're going to load it onto the boards and actually make it work on your FPGA chip. So you're actually going to make a processor, run code on it in simulation. If it works, then you're going to load it onto the FPA chip. Okay? So therefore, forwarding in your pipeline is going to be important to be able to do this. All right. All right, now, a few days ago, you guys came in and said, Hoja, at the beginning of project number one, I was so scared. I didn't know anything about MIPS programming. I thought, how am I going to do this? And most of you said, but we figured it out, and I got a great team, and we did it step by step. Don't get scared about project two, just because I've said the word pipelining and MIPS and Verilog. You can do it. You're, you're, it's not going to be impossible. It's going to be very possible, but you're going to need the discipline of good engineering and not panic and not wait till the last minute. You're going to need teamwork. You're going to need dividing the labor up well. You're going to need all those things. Now, I'm not going to assign it until after spring break, so you can have a nice spring break and don't worry about it. Okay? <laughs> but it might, be, it might be good to look at your Verilog. Just dust off the Verilog a little bit and, because you're going to do a lot of Verilog in, in the second project. Okay? But only in the implementation stage. The design has to come first. Verilog is just an implementation model, just like MIPS. First you design your answer, then you implement. Right. Oh, that got discussion started. Oh, oh. <laughs> all right. So, you know, like we've said here, all modern processors pipeline, all modern code has data dependencies. In order to not stall, we've got to find a way to solve the hazards you're looking at the best way there is, which is, which is forwarding data. But it only solves the data hazards. doesn't solve the control hazards. doesn't solve the st uh, structural hazards. Those have to be solved other ways. This only solves the data hazards. All right. 
Any any round of comments? Panic attacks? <laughs> Fear? Culp Chris? Any, any, anybody having any medical needs? Blood pressure going a little too high? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ajivarma. <laughs> He's got his hand on his heart like, like that. Okay. All right, let's go on then. And if, if there's no reason to stay here, I'm happy to stay here. As long as everybody needs me, we'll stay here. But if, if we're okay, then let's go forward. All right. Okay, now, another issue is called memory-to-memory -memory copies. Okay, look at the code. Load it out, store it back. This is actually done pretty often. Look what, can you see what this code does? What's the code doing? Yeah, it's copying from one memory location to another, but more than that. Those are same, those are different. What does that tell you? Yeah, I'm moving from one array to a different array. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so this says at same offset position, but beginning different base addresses, move the data item. So maybe I'm copying from a buffer or copying from an array or something like that. That's very common inside computers is to move data around from memory to memory. It has to come into a register and then go back out. Now we want to do this as quickly as possible. If I wait till it all the way gets into the register, and then say, now you can send it back out again, I'm going to have to stall. I'm going to have bubbles. So I don't want to do that. So look how I'm going to forward. This data is available before it gets into here. It's in that pipeline register, and that's fine for going to here in the next clock cycle. So from here's output to here's input. So the data memory is going to have to have a multiplexer at the beginning to choose between two options. And the two options are coming forward from ALU or coming back around from output of memory. Everybody see that? Same thing as before. Instead, now it's not the ALU that's being forwarded to, it's the memory input being forwarded to. Now, is it memory address or memory data that we're forwarding here? Memory data. Yeah, memory data, exactly. The output of memory is data, and it's coming back around to the data input uh, because this wants to write data, this wants to read data. Okay. So this particular combination also, uh, as it says, would need a forwarding unit and a MUX to be put on the beginning of the memory stage. All right. Any question? Any question about that before we go forward? All right. We're talking about forwarding, and but I don't want to go forward until until we're okay here. Right, so a new issue, but it's solved the exact same way. Stick on a multiplexer, give a feedback path, give a control signal, make a circuit to decide the value of the control signal. Okay. Toma, is in Isle. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's bad. Okay. All right. Uh, we're gonna try to <laughs> we're gonna try to do this one anyway. Can you see that the word stall is written here? Yeah, but can you also see the word subtract is written here? And it wants to get a value here and then use it here. And we call that load use. And we remember, load use cannot be solved with forwarding. We're going to have to stall. So the stall is supposed to be what happens here. So then the sub is supposed to go down to here. And whatever was here has to go down to here. That's what happened. You know, unfortunately, two slides got put together. So see all this blue stuff? You fetched it. And then as soon as you realize that there was this data dependency and it cannot be forwarded, we have to kill. Okay? We're not going to allow that, so we just have to kill. Now, we can work with the next one and the next one and the next one. They also use, as you see here, register one, register one, register one, no problem. Green, green, green. This red became green when we moved it down. Can you see that? Okay, so, or it was red and then it became green. So what the meaning of this is, as it says about it, we will still need one stall cycle even with forwarding because it's a load use, load sub or load add or load whatever, load in. So if you load it and need it in the next instruction, you can't have it. You cannot have it. Forwarding will not do miracles, so you can't have it. Okay, we, we knew that already anyway. This is just a review of what we had already shown. Okay, I'm sorry about the horrible slide. Today the slides are not being very nice to me. Okay, now what we have to do here is detect that and stall. So you can see that if, 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 
stall the pipeline. There's no forwarding. So you've got to find that situation and say, don't do anything, put in a bubble. So what is the situation? If I'm doing a mem read in the IDEX, and if the register that I'm trying to uh, <coughs> put it into, that's the, right, put it into the destination. Right? Memory reads are called loads, aren't they? And where do they put the thing they're going to load? Into RT. So if I'm doing a memory read, which we're, if I'm doing a load, and if the destination for the load that I will put it in happens to be the, one of the source registers for a IDEX IFED. Which one's earlier? Which one's later? You have to know now. IDEX goes to the execute stage. IF is fetch, so this is earlier. So if a later instruction, which is earlier in the pipeline, wants to read from the place where an earlier instruction, which is farther in the pipeline, says I will write to, we've got a problem. And especially if it happens to be a memory read, namely a uh, load word instruction, this is, what have you detected here? What have you detected here? Load use. This says we're going to load, this says you're trying to use it. Or this, what happened here? Yeah, if the thing I'm going to write it to is either my RS or my RT in the later instruction, you're in trouble, there's no fix, stall the pipeline. Okay, did you get that code? You gotta be able to read the code. This is, this is the expression of what I've been saying to you in words, but now it's formal, it's Beecham cell. So it's just got a little syntax to it. This is the name of the register, dot, that's the name of the field in the register. Okay, so if the RS field in the earlier, no, the later instruction, further down, which means earlier in the pipeline, is saying you need to read from someplace now, and that's the place that we will write in the future when we get done with the load word. No way to resolve it, just stall. Or RT, either one. All right, I th think that should be clear, but it may not be. Buren, ask. Yeah. Does stall the pipeline shift the instruction order? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it does. Let's go back and see what happened. Um, what it does is it says, this PC should not change, so we should again fetch from the same place. But this one, which we fetched, we're going to kill. So we fetched it, we found out we got a problem, we kill it, we don't change the PC, so that means that you go to the same place again one clock cycle later, and that's why sub is also here. I don't, you can't really see it, but but the sub from here went to here, whatever was here. Everything shifted down because you sort of like you in inserted a no-op. But it isn't a no-op. You fetched and then killed. Okay, that's called stall the pipeline. You have it. Oh, this is going to be a trouble. Don't do anything. Let it just, you know, waste the time. That's, that's, in fact, so what will happen is this thing will move to here, 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 and here, but we'll never change any values. We don't write into here, we don't write into here. So whatever it was, we won't change anything, therefore it's a dead instruction. It's a dead instruction. And the PC stays the same, so you fetch again the same thing. So a stall means hold the PC, don't let it advance, and that means you'll fetch the same one again. So you kill what you have, because it's no good, it's going to cause a load use hazard, and we don't want to do that, and then you fetch it again in the next, the next one. Okay, good question. All right. More? Yeah, okay. So instead of instead of stall? No, in this solution we don't. We just stall. The problem was we already fetched and then found out Zavala biz, we can't do it. So there's nothing to do. Yanni, the point is an instruction here, the sub was fetched. And then our only choice was to kill it. So it's too late to fetch something different in that cycle. You can fetch something in this cycle, but it should be the sub. You know, was, you know, to change the code at this point is too late. But hardware reordering could do that, okay? And in fact, software reordering could also. 
software, the compiler could say, wait a minute, that's a load and that's a use. I know that's going to be trouble and could put something useful here in the way, yeah, of course. But once it's in order and we fetch it, life is difficult. All right. Um, so we did that. So the first line tests to see if the instruction now in the execute stage is a load word. The next two lines find out if the destination of that load word matches the, one of the source registers for the next instruction. If it does, you have a load use hazard. So then you have to stall. And after this one stall, the forwarding logic can handle the remaining data, data hazards after you stall once. Then normal forwarding. In other words, everybody see here that this load word on register 1 and this on register 1 can't be fixed. But after that, if it's here or here or here, we, we're OK. Normal forwarding hardware can, can fix it. It just can't fix it if it's in that spot right there. All right. Um, now, we, 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 you asked this question, what happens on a stall? You know, what, what do you need for hardware to cause a stall? Um, and so this, is, this slide is about that. Along with the hazard unit, we have to implement the stall. So preventing instructions in the um, fetch and the decode stages from progressing down the pipeline is done by preventing the PC register from changing and also preventing the IFID pipeline register from changing. Or as I've already fetched it, just keep it and keep the PC. So we just hold those two and let everything else just kind of trickle out. So now this hazard detection unit is going to control the writing of the PC. So the hazard detection unit has the power to let the PC write or not write. If it doesn't write, it just holds its value. So PC.write and IFID.write registers are in control of the hazard detection. They don't write every time. I think we had the model until now that PC writes every time. It just changes its value. One of those values, branch or sequential or jump, is going to be the new value. Now we have an option that says don't write if we had a hazard or a stall. Just keep the same. And same thing with the pipeline registers. We had the idea that there was a clock connected to them all, and they all always just move forward. Well, now we've got the ability for one of them to say, no, we're not going to write it. We'll leave it alone. So it holds its value. That means what we fetched, we keep. All right. Um, then the next thing to do is to insert a bubble between the load word instruction and the load use instruction in the next stage. And essentially, you just clear the values um, to 0 so that nothing writes. And there's a no-op doesn't write anything. So if you clear the values to 0, you have an all 0 instruction. Nothing gets written. So that, that put in the bubble. Uh, you set the control bits in the EX, MEM, and WB control fields to all zero. I don't know if that had occurred to anybody, but um, if all these bits coming out of here are zero, what that means is it tells this one don't do anything, and this one don't do anything, and this one don't do anything. All the things that, that control writing, such as memory write or register write, are set to zero. So therefore, nothing's going to happen. Um, OK. And so then the load word instruction and the instructions that come after it in the pipeline, which are before it in the code, proceed normally down the pipeline. We just, in other words, what that's saying is nothing's affected before here, just from this point. And then, on, then we fix and we continue after that. All right, so now we added some new hardware. We talked about this hazard unit. We already had a forwarding unit. We already had two control units. Now we've got some new hardware called the hazard unit. And what it has to do is decide, do we stall? Okay. This one's very optimistic. Says, I always forward. But this one says, well, sometimes you're not good enough. I, I'm smarter. I'm a higher level. I know when it's time to just stall. You're not able to solve the problem. So again, the hazard unit gets some inputs from some places. From this one, it gets the IDEX mem read signal, because it needed that to know, are we doing a load word? And it needs a couple more that it gets from various places. The IDEX register RT comes to it, and IDIF write is generated from it. So you can see it gets to decide if this gets to write, and it gets to decide if this gets to write. That's just what we said. It can cause those to not write. It can also tell this mux here, don't take the normal control signals. Take a set of zeros and put everybody zero. Well, then nothing's going to happen. So if you're going to stall, you say, don't write, don't write, and everybody here will be zero. So that's what this is, a big vector of zeros. And it'll say, don't choose that normal nine bits. Choose my nine zeros. Put them in here. Nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. You, you essentially killed the instruction, bubbled or stalled the pipeline. Is that pretty clear? 
All right, so now what have we got? We got the ability to forward when forwarding works and the ability to stall when it doesn't work. Okay. You might call this hazard fix. You might call this, you know, <laughs> can't be fixed. <laughs> okay. They're both trying to fix hazards. This one does a good job most of the time, but we've seen already there are some. Now, can I ask you a question? Load use is the only hazard that we couldn't fix in the MIPS pipeline so far. Do you think if I go to some of those other processor architectures and their pipelines or an Intel pipeline that load use will be the only hazard that we can't fix? I hope your answer is no. It de depends on the pipeline. Just like I told you, what's a hazard and what's not depends on the pipeline. The ones that can be fixed and can't be fixed also depends on the pipeline. Nasty pipelines that are complicated and deep have more problems and more stalls. And therefore, when they have more stalls, they go this way more. And pipelines that are little and short and simple don't have too much, and they don't go too much above the ideal. So, oh, I've got a 20-stage pipeline. Great, but what's your CPI? Well, we don't like to talk about that. It's not even very close to one at all. See, so just pipeline depth alone is not the whole story. Um, the issue is how often does your pipeline not be able, even with this helping hardware, to recover from the hazards? And the answer is, depends on the pipeline. So therefore, all we're saying here is, this is MIPS, and you can imagine that each architecture will have to fight these battles and solve these problems in their own way, according to the architecture. Yeah, okay, hold you. how come you're not teaching us all eight or 12 or 20 or 1,000 architectures in your course. How come there's unsolved problems that you're just causing us to imagine and be worried about and lose sleep at night? Because <laughs> there's a lot of unsolved problems out there in the world. You have to learn to sleep at night anyway. <laughs> you can't worry about everything. Worry about the ones that come to you. All right. I think we're just about out of time. Let's see where we are here. Yeah, it looks like a good place to stop. So we'll pick up right there having um, we'll talk about control hazards that's a good place to begin the next thing so we've looked at data hazards pretty thoroughly now we'll talk about control hazards in the next class okay have a great weekend everybody enjoy see you on tuesday <laughs>